I'd like to introduce our moderator and communication design winner, Stephen Doyle, who will in turn introduce the other panelists. Stephen Doyle is the creative director at Doyle Partners, a design studio specializing in identity, packaging, signage, environment, and editorial design. Some of his notable projects include branding, packaging, and in-store presentations of Martha Stewart every day, and an identity for Barnes & Noble. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Doyle. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome, and welcome. Um, years ago, I read a story that in a small medieval town, a meteor fell and the people rushed out to see what it was and the town fathers got together to discuss what to do with it. And after much thought, they decided to roll this rock into a cave so it wouldn't fly away again. I see that meteor as being a metaphor for the design process. The meteor is the design problem and it falls at your feet. And it's we who have to decide how to deal with it, whether to roll it into a cave or something else. Our, our job as designers, I think, is using just our wits and our imagination is to try to get that stone to defy gravity and fly away again. We've got a distinguished panel tonight who have each gotten their meteors to fly. I'd like to introduce them to you briefly, and then we'll have a little conversation and um, time for question and answers. Tom Dare, furthest from me, is the co-founder of Smart Design, which he founded 30 years ago. Um, Tom holds 19 patents. The, the National Design Museum awarded this award to SMART because they use insight and innovation to design consumer products that meet people's needs, answer market demands, and solve critical manufacturing challenges. To Tom's right, your left, is Steve Kiernan from Kieran Timberlake Architecture. The Design Museum says of their work, Kieran Timberlake is noted for the, its integration of research with design, guided by a deep environmental ethic. Comprised of more than 50 professionals, Kieran Timberlake has produced a diverse body of work for arts, civic, educational, government, and residential clients. Next is Ellen Nisus, a senior associate at James Corner Field Operations, who has won the award for landscape design. The museum says, with the cross-disciplinary backgrounds of its 30 professionals, including in landscape, architecture, urban design, and architecture, and communication art, the firm creates the high quality solutions for cities, landscapes, and public spaces. They've raised visibility and efficacy of landscape architecture in shaping and enriching people's lives, particularly in urban environments and the public realm. Next up is Bill Sofield, principal of Sofield Studio, who's won this year's award for interior design. The museum says, design must live as well as, as it looks. Bill's holistic approach is grounded on craft and materials, and he creates spaces that are highly original, compelling, and welcoming. Studio Sofield is an interdisciplinary design collective integrating landscape, residential, retail, corporate, hospitality, and furniture design. Sitting next to me is Lisa Straussfeld, a uh, partner at Pentagram, who has won this year's Interactive Design Award. She's known, they say, as the Tiger Woods of data visualization. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully without the handkerchief. <laughs> the museum says, Lisa's trailblazing work lies at the intersection of physical and virtual space. Her digital information design projects range from software and websites to interpretive displays and large-scale media installations for civic, cultural, and corporate clients. She holds four patents for user interface and intelligent information search and retrieval. You guys, let's have a little conversation about how you decided to do what you do and how you discovered your voice within your chosen field. Tom, you've said, when we started, we were designing pots and pans, basically casseroles you put in the oven that sold for nine or $10, things that were found in every Kmart, 
and Macy's. And early on, we realized for us it was more fulfilling to design for everyday customers. When did you realize that you wanted to design products for everyday people? Um, well, hello everybody. I guess you can hear me, right? This is for you. Um, so this is my inspiration slide. Um, I think when I was about in seventh grade, <clears throat> my dad took me to see 2001 Space Odyssey, which if you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. Um, you know, I was, I was amazed at the movie itself, but what, after a while, it wasn't so much about what's the movie, what's the plot, what did it all mean. I was really amazed that they could actually kind of prototype and create this um, almost like an option for the future and capture it on a film and serve it up and have it be so realistic, so, so believable. And um, I thought that that was very interesting. And I think that's one of the things that you know, designers have the ability to do uh, is, is uh, in our work every day is looking into the future and sort of saying like, this is the way it is now, but this is the way it could be two years from now or five years from now. So, um, so, so this you're inventing is, a fiction in a way. Yes, well, it could be fiction if it never goes anywhere. But if it do, does go somewhere, then you actually kind of have the ability to sort of um, chart the course in a way. And that was very interesting to me. Thank you. Steve, you graduated from Yale magna cum laude, and you got a master's of architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, where you currently teach um, as an adjunct professor. Professor, in addition to having teaching posts at the University of Washington, Yale, the University of Michigan, and Princeton. I'm wondering, I have a two-part question for you. When did you realize that you wanted to be an architect, and how do you balance such a serious commitment to teaching? Okay, part one. Um, the, uh, the origins of the interest, um, certainly a journey of sorts. Um, if you look carefully at the um, lower right corner of the image of the Bengali tiger on the left, you'll see the uh, name Steve K, the nom de l'artiste, uh, carefully inscribed there. And uh, at the age of seven, my fascination was much more with the tiger. Uh, but if you look carefully in the background, you'll see four primitive huts, um, original dwellings that continue certainly to um, fascinate, um, uh, and they were clearly in the background rather than the foreground at seven, um, but they've flipped um, over the years. Um, I moved uh, away from arts, um, certainly by the time I was a teenager, I can't remember exactly when, and started working on the other half of my brain for a considerable period of time. and. Um, spent my first two years at Yale as an economics major, interestingly, and um, um, I owe that, um, to that, my uh, interest in architecture. I got a summer internship in Athens, Greece, and uh, went, and it was in an industrial development bank, and in, instead of tending to that, I spent the summer looking at archaeology, and uh, on the way home, um, by myself, uh, taking a train through Zurich, I happened to see the building on the right, and um, on the spot, it, I decided uh, I'm done with economics. I'm going to go do architecture. So, uh, that that's it. It was uh, Real on the spot, a little epiphany, and it was over and done with. So, wasn't particularly torturous. Um, a little bit of a journey between. Um, uh, right and left sides of the brain that I continue to exercise now, not over long time frames of 10 years between those two incidents or more, but uh, daily, literally. I like that there's a little water, you know, protecting the huts from the Bengal tiger here. Very thoughtful painting, et cetera. Absolutely. So what's trying to think ahead. Thing? How do you balance that in a 50 person studio? Oh, same thing. I've always taught, my partner and I have never not taught. Um, uh, I think on some levels we're terrified of stopping teaching and um, therefore can't and won't. Uh, but it just seems part of existence. Uh, we have a, a practice based on asking questions and trying to answer them. And um, that inquiry just seems to come naturally out of teaching. And the two don't seem particularly separate for us. They, they work together. We run a design studio that does as much teaching as it does designing, I think. And do you hire students? 
We have. They've certainly been a wonderful source of uh, great employees over the years. Uh, so we've hired some students, yes. Thank you. Ellen, you've, you got your Bachelor of Science from Carnegie Mellon. You got a Master in Public Policy from Harvard, and then a Master's in Landscape Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, where you also teach, I think. Is that right? I did, yeah. Yeah. Um, for seven years, you managed economic development and public policy projects, and for a time, you were the program director at the Center for Alternate Sentencing and Employment Services. Tell us a little bit about the transition from convicts to landscapes. <laughs> Um, you, you phrased it a little differently than when I first met you and you said your time in prison. <laughs> We're among friends here, so they won't tell. Um, the only part you missed was, uh, I don't know where you, you unearthed that, that biography, but um, I started out in sculpture actually at RISD, uh, long, at the very beginning, and um, the, you know, I loved making things always, but I had a sort of strange feeling when I showed up for school there that we were all just, you know, doing self-portraits in one form or another because we were 18 and we had no life experience. So I think part of my travels were about having some life experience um, and trying to see what things were all about. and. Um, it my you know when you ask James Corner who was the founder of our firm this question, he tells about being at Manchester Metropolitan University and taking a career guidance uh, test, and the results of that test recommended landscape architecture for him because it combined biology and art and economics and math and outdoorsmanship and horticulture and all the things that he was interested in. Um, in New Hampshire, they did not have very good guidance counseling tests. <laughs> and so it, it was sort of a long journey for me to discover a field. I think, you know, landscape architecture is sort of unknown among design fields. Yeah. Most people don't really know what it entails. My parents to this day think that I, you know, am a gardener. And so, you know, it was a long time for me to figure out that this was a field that, you know, involved strategy and communication and an engagement with urbanism at a very deep level um, that wasn't just about physical form making and growing things, but there, you know, there were so many layers and dimensions of it and that they all kind of met up with the things that I was curious about. And, um, I guess I would say, you know, maybe one thing that's a little bit different about landscape architects from other kinds of designers is that one of the things we have in common is that we all like the untidiness and unpredictability and society, um, the social aspect of collaborative production of these, you know, public space is a bureaucratic, political, long-term, uh, production and you have to kind of enjoy the messiness of all of the dimensions of that, all the things that you can't control and won't know. And I took me a while to, to find this. And the same thing happens to landscape, you know. Exactly. Hailstorm coming in, there it goes. There goes the Green garden. leaves carpet the ground. It's not yeah. quite what you expected. Great. Thank you. Hey Bill, you grew up in Metuchen in what has been described as a purist and spare house. You studied architecture and urban planning at Princeton after focusing on art history and European cultural studies. The description of the materials that you used to create what the museum called original and welcoming worlds are positively delicious. It's a very exotic menu of extravagance, lavishness, and theater like a cast bronze crocodile desk or Madagascar Macassar ebony or a sable hair, hair chair, chair, try that again, sable hair chair, um, or eggshell marquetry. And then for fun, you throw in an albino python, 300 monarch butterflies, or taxidermy bears. When was it that you realized that you were obsessed with color and materials and drama? Um, I, believe it or not, in spite of all that lavishness, I, I think I first started 
um, with the egg. Uh, as a child, I really only ate eggs. I love the packaging. <laughs> Today, I eat, I eat an egg every day. I just, I loved everything about eggs. But you, not, the, <laughs> not the kind that come on the shake-up. I, I love the asymmetry of them. I love silly putty. I just was fascinated by the egg. <laughs> and um, is there a and, and so much potential. And then I heard Leonardo da Vinci said it was mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful forms. So I, I feel justified. Um, and, and I just, but I remember the light going over it and just absolutely fascinating. But uh, you didn't want to be a chicken farmer. Didn't want to be a chicken farmer. The other thing I, I did, which was which was a wonderful thing my mom did, we went for a walk in, we lived in the middle Bird of a bird sanctuary. sanctuary. And we went for a walk in the woods every day. And my family's very, very rigorous. We kept a, a log. Um, we'd paste things into it. But really for, I guess, five years, maybe age four to whatever four and five is nine, uh, I uh, was forced to, to walk and go to each one of these stations and record exactly what I saw. Um, and that's easy in summer. It's really difficult in January when you're looking at a flower. But my mother would say something had changed. Each day something had changed. What would it be? And it was a great way of kind of honing, honing the eye um, into just noticing pattern and texture. But then also the travel of other objects. And perhaps that's how I ended up in retail. You know, just watching that bee flight pattern of a salesperson going across, down a staircase, across the sales floor, down another staircase, into the stock room up. And, you know, just how all of those bee flight patterns intersect. So I would say somehow in, the, in both of those lies the kernel of, of, how, of how I got, got started. Perfect. Lisa. You're one of twins. Oh. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you studied art yeah. history and computer science at Brown. Mm -hmm. You went to the Harvard Graduate School of Design and Architecture. And then you ended up working at Motorola designing layouts of memory chips. Next, you were at MIT Media Lab, so impressed by Muriel Cooper that you named your own daughter Muriel. And then you started a software company in San Francisco called Perspecta, which has the same number of letters as Pentagram. Did you know that? <laughs> and then you were off to do a sports entertainment for Quokka Sports, right? Data, visual, data visualiz visualization as an entertainment form. Mm -hmm. And then you ended up at Pentagram. It's kind of a fascinating, meandering path of architecture and computers and, and design and data. When did you realize that you had landed on data as a path? Okay, somehow I have to connect this to the bottle for my dream of genie <laughs> <laughs> and Mary Tyler Moore's apartment. Um, okay, let me uh, let me attempt to do that. Knock yourself um, out. So, like I think at least two of this panel, I grew up in New Jersey. Metuchen and you, Livingston. Livingston, okay. Um, Bridgewater, um, Boundbrook, New Jersey. Um, I'm a Jersey girl um, growing up in the 70s. Um, and I loved the bottle from I Dream of Jeannie um, and Mary Tell More. I think I, I just had a revelation today that I, I think I modeled my life out um, with Mary Tell More. Uh, so, how did I get from there to here? Um, actually, the image that I really wanted to show, somehow I'll, I'll make my way there. Um, I couldn't because I thought it was a little bit too provocative, and it was an image of a swastika, actually. Um, oh, bear with me for a moment. Um, and I, uh, at the same age that I think I was deciding to become an architect, because that was the only, it was either architect, architecture or fashion, um, that I was aware of, and my mother was an urban planner who always wanted to be an architect. So I decided at the age of six to become an architect, and I did, in fact, study architecture. Um, but at the same age, I drew swastikas all over my Hebrew school notebook, um, and was told, of course, after class... That, How did that make you feel? <laughs> that, um, ...that I should not do that. Um, and of course, I was too young to... Uh, learn at, uh, you know, where did you, where'd you get the swastika though? I mean, where'd you get that? Well, I just saw reference? the image and I guess that the point is that somehow it connects to that is that um, I thought it was the most perfect and beautiful form. So at an early age, I was attracted to uh, beauty and certain forms. Um, it was my version of the egg, if you will. 
Um, it has the perfect balance of static and dynamic qualities. It's what um, years later I learned to describe as clear ambiguity. And in fact, when I was in architecture, somehow architecture school, somehow all of my plans had a kind of swastika <laughs> sort of dynamic static um, balance to them. So it's perfect, it just has bad connotations. Exactly, it's, um, it's unfortunate that we can't kind of... It's trying. It's trying, yes, yes, it has that reference, but we can yeah, never really, it's, we have to de-reference it at the moment. But, um, um, but I was kind I'll of- I'll settle a, for Barbara Eden. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was uh, sort of, I was always interested in art and I was a math geek and uh, my career is always, it was always kind of like somehow course correcting those two interests. Yeah, and, interesting brain balance, yeah. Um, for myself, I, I always wanted to be a painter, and I'll never forget um, a day in 1972 when I was a sophomore in high school when Life magazine arrived at the house, and I saw this crazy thing, which was Gene Davis painting the street in front of the Philadelphia Museum with the stripes that he paints. And it was, in fact, the largest painting in the world at the time, and I was so like thrilled with the idea that the art could actually come out of the museum. And I didn't know, I had no idea that that was going to point to where I was gonna go, but I'm, I'm somewhere in that world of um, artistic temperament, but wanting to be out engaging with the public. And I, I, I pose this question to you guys to provide images of that, that aha moment and um, I was thrilled to be able to find this picture of Gene Davis actually painting the largest painting in the world. Art, you know, kind of tumbling down the stairs of the museum and out onto the street. Hey, Tom. <coughs> Here's a quote from you. A few years ago, we were working on the design of a new toaster. The client was looking for something that would make a statement in the counter landscape. What's a counter landscape? How, how can we think of, or how can you as a designer think of a kitchen counter as a landscape and create a toaster that says hello? And then if the toaster says hello, what does the blender say or the refrigerator? How, how do you balance everything wanting to get its amount of attention in the store, which is by me, but then come into the house and be quieter than the kids? Well, I think it's, you know, depending on your client and the kind of domestic environment that we live in, certainly a lot of people who, you know, develop and market products want their products to, you know, attract attention, right? People need to, they need to, people need to buy that product for that company to stay in business. Although, um, you could think about product design as perhaps a functional sculpture that might sit on the countertop. Uh, it is really, you know, people who really take pride in their kitchen, I think they can create a landscape. Well, sometimes there's just a big mess on the countertop, so um, it adds to that mess and confusion. Um, but I think if the, um, you know, if the toaster's saying hello, maybe the blender's saying goodbye, and you've got a matching set, right? But, you know, that would be lucky enough that you could uh, design the whole uh, suite of appliances, I think, for, for that environment. Sometimes you're limited by, um, you know, your little piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I think um, that also leaves a lot up to the interpretation of the homeowner and the items that they select that represent themselves, really, because uh, I think it's, you know, it's a, they buy them because, well, maybe they hope they make good toast, uh, but also it's, whether they think about it or not or whether it's conscious or not, I think it's really, uh, you know, reflection upon themselves, the things that people surround themselves with in, in their environment. So, uh, you know, designers, I think we like to have everything be a certain way. Um, and maybe uh, we would like all our appliances to create a beautiful symphony on that landscape. Um, that's great. That's great if you kind of have that forethought and that vision and you kind of can create that environment. A lot of people just want a nice toaster and that's fine too. Yeah. Later on in that same quote, uh, you, you say, a few years later, we landed a project with a food company, and their specialty was breakfast food and cereals. Our project was to reinvent breakfast. That was a fun project. What's with that? Yeah. Right. Well, so, um, 
Yeah, I think that um, we were working for a food company and um, they made a lot of breakfast products. They, uh, I think they were suffering from um, competition. There were a lot of Me Too products out there. I think culture was changing. People were not, you know, the idea of like the family coming down at 7.30 in the morning and everybody sitting at the uh, kitchen table and eating breakfast, that was really changing. People were eating breakfast in their cars. They were eating breakfast on the subway, uh, riding their bicycle. And uh, the project was really sort of look at, I think, human behavior and culture and like how, how were people thinking about the morning meal? And is there, you know, was there something as designers that we could do to perhaps um, create some sort of new form factor, some sort of new type of product that would maybe more coincide with, you know, people's behavior and tendencies. Or speed so, or something. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, uh, you know, cornflakes is great, and we still have cornflakes, but cornflakes are a product that are, you know, they're over 100 years <clears> old, <throat> maybe 110 years old or so. So, um, you know, maybe there is room from time to time for things that come up that fit the way people live. Yeah. Smart Design designs such a range of products from OXO Good Grips to the New York taxi graphics, medical devices, photo printers, even medical gowns for Johnson & Johnson. When you're working on such an incredible range, how do you find your own voice as a designer? Well, I think that, uh, I think that uh, it's not so much about my voice. It's really about uh, understanding our client, their needs, um, figuring out how we're going to solve the problem. Uh, and. And um, I think in, in the case of design, it's not like a math problem where you're, you're kind of going down the road to the solution. There are many solutions to a design problem. And I think part of that uh, exploration is uh, trying to find the best path. And, and to find that best path, you have to uh, certainly think about your client. You have to certainly think about the end user, the people using the products. Uh, what experience are they going to have with it? Uh, you kind of mix that in with your own creativity, and I think each project we we tend to come up with a you know it's a new solution. It's not it's based a on a place. style or a formula or anything like that. And in fact, um, you know it's kind of interesting. I put this picture up here because I think it's interesting. Um, the idea is to design half a baby for people with small apartments. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it was actually the design for that toaster, but it didn't work out. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, a lot of, when I get interviewed, people say, well, like, I, you know, I know about, you know, you've got some success stories out there, but tell me about the failures. And, um, you know, I like to, I think we like to think about the failures as really uh, mini learning experiences. And, I, you know, failure to me sounds like you went through this big endeavor and there are millions of people behind it and you all jumped off a cliff and, and died and that was it. That was a failure. Whereas, for instance, with the design of diapers, we try to figure out how to prototype something very quickly and uh, put it through some sort of simulation, learn from it, and you know, if it fails, it's great. And sometimes, you know, the failures were very entertaining with some of these diapers. <laughs> we were actually, you know, injecting them with applesauce. Uh, but just as in, you know, that 2001 Space Odyssey, where, where Kubrick and and uh, Arthur Clarke created this prototype <coughs> of this environment. You know, it's not a real environment. It's just like a vision. I think designers again do this the same thing, but maybe it's on a much, sometimes not on a grand scale, but mostly it's just like if you could do it in 10 minutes create something and learn from it, that's, mm -hmm. that's really how we try to solve our problems. Stephen, the, the museum mentioned about your firm that there's a deep environmental ethic. Where does that come from? Oh, I, I, you know, I think it's been there uh, as long as the firm was, has been there, which means it was there, James so it, and I, at personal. least before. It's very personal, no doubt about it. I mean, back in the 1980s when we started, we were designing buildings with completely self-finishing material palettes um, that came very close to eliminating materials like paint and that really would require no ongoing maintenance over time. And this is before and, it was the rage to think well, that way. Yeah, it was actually a fairly curious thought to most people at the time. And um, we, we like defining disciplines like that to the problems we undertake. And, um, you know, forcing them in directions that really push you, but it's just something we came by early on and naturally and has evolved, you know, substantially over the years and the level of sophistication of the questions 
we're asking and trying to solve um, is ever more demanding as, as we move forward. Was there, for you in the design process, was there an aha moment when you realized this is what I'm all about, this is where I'm going to work, this, this is my <coughs> That's, actually, that's the one um, question, actually, that in some ways I really object to. Um, I'm, I'm a good panelist, so I'm going to answer it anyway directly, but um, I object to it in this sense that um, every project you undertake as a designer, it seems to me, ought to have um, some sort of an aha moment of self-discovery in it, or you shouldn't be working on the project. <clears throat> um, in other words, if you're not somehow advancing the state of the art that you're working on, um, with each project you undertake, then it's not a good project for you. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing it. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think of it in, um, in terms of a single moment. I think of it as thousands of moments along the way that um, most of which you completely forget about, but somehow evolve over time into a, um, uh, you, you know, a more dramatic and deeper understanding of what you're doing. In the case of architecture, I think that understanding comes very, very slowly. It's painfully gained. Um, the experiments um, in architecture are often quite slow and take a long time in between conception, actualization, and then understanding what you didn't do very well and what you could have done better. So the learning curve is, is slow and requires many years. And, uh, um, you know, but when I reflect on, um, to answer your question, um, one significant moment for us certainly was when we took a lot of the accumulated sense we had been developing over many, many projects and many years of what was wrong with the way we were designing buildings and articulated it in a, um, a little modest manifesto about how to write what was wrong in it. Um, that was certainly a moment of self-reflection for us where we accumulated a lot of that knowledge, um, articulated it in a little manifesto, and then that was swiftly followed by an opportunity to build a little house that basically took on every single agenda in the manifesto and tried to actualize it, which, again, is very, very difficult to attain in architecture clients because the cost of what they're doing is so substantial there's a significant level of conservatism when it comes to experimentation. Um, so finding venues where you can holistically experiment with an entire theory and agenda, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so the Lob Lolly House <clears throat> expresses the learning in refabricating architecture. That's correct. I mean, in a lot of ways for us, it was building the book um, would be one way to think about it. That's fabulous. That's a good answer to an objectionable question. Yes. <laughs> you know, and uh, one thing you said, by the way, on the, the failure side of the equation, we always, in our research efforts, like to say you need to figure out a way to fail fast mm -hmm. and um, really fast, because if you go too far down the line, you can't back up on it. So for us, um, a lot of what we've tried to do is figure out ways to um, find answers to questions by failing swiftly. So. Mm -hmm in a field that's not good at accepting failure, first of all, right. and it's not very fast. So. Failure slow. Yeah. Ellen, New Yorkers uh, relate uh, field operations with the High Line. Can you articulate for us what, what is different about the High Line because you were the firm that took it on rather than some of the competition? Um. I think you know what appealed to people about the about our pitch for that job was that we weren't saying leave it alone as a strange self-sown uh, catwalk one story above the ground um, and don't completely transform it and make it into something you know that that has no flavor of what was there before and. Uh, you know, taking the middle ground between those two points. Um, I think, you know, 
whatever we do, I, I think the, the aspect about the, of the work that we do that I like the best is um, going to the new place and figuring out what it's all about. Um, so when you do that in your own city, it's a little bit different when we go to another place. Um, one of the things that's interesting about landscape is just that um, there's a, you know, all settlement was originally about the natural constraints, natural opportunities of sites. And people settled in the locations they did because there was a protected harbor or there was a marsh full of fish and game or, um, you know, there were uh, good lookouts and you could defend a position. And in landscape, they call it the genius of the place, um, which is kind of a common way of talking about it for us, but maybe less so for other design disciplines. But you're, you're always trying to kind of plumb what's specific about why was that place cultivated by the people it was and the way it was? Why did the, what's specific about the geology and the soils and the plants and the animals that live there? And to try and bring that to presence um, in whatever design overlays you, you add to it now. And in the High Line, that was, there was a combination of ideas about strategy and what was specific about you know, that part of the west side of Manhattan, what was already happening there with art galleries and other things, and uh, trying to find a way. I mean, it, it, the, the thing that we talked about in our interview for that project to the public uh, was we, we wanted to create kind of a, a way of making, of slowing you down. Um, it doesn't connect any particularly essential points in New York, and its primary purpose is to slow you down and make you act in a way that's different from the ways you act in other places, on the street uh, and in parks in New York. And that's a kind of funny thing that ended up really being inhabited in a, in a quirky way. Um, this answer is making me think of T.S. Eliot and this perfect language that goes against this construction, which is, April is the cruelest month, mixing memory and desire. And what you guys have accomplished up there is mixing memory with desire, the, you know, the recalling what it was and the desire for it to be a public place. That's nice. That slows you down like that. It's really That's lovely. Nice. I mean, the second image here is uh, two weeks ago on the top of an unimproved part of Fresh Kills. Um, people came out to build birdhouses and do pony rides and fly kites that they made on the site. Do you guys know about this project at Fresh Kills? Fresh Kills is a, um, it's, it used to be a dump in Staten Island and it's three times the size of Central Park. And some people say that it holds the volume of the Great Wall in China. It's been a decade in the making already and it's got three more decades before it's finished. So talk about slowing things down a little bit. It's a, you know, it's a radically different kind of site. It's different people showed up for this. There were many fewer bikini tops and, uh, you know, it was a, it, people Not took... Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> it took hours for people to get out there and they weren't <laughs> seeing a new park. We were unveiling a landfill. You know, an unimproved, this was a section that has not been rebuilt in any way. And it was uh, it, both experiences of seeing how these two different sites in their different states are, are populated by New Yorkers at different events make you love this city. Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, there, there are so many different kinds of people who show up to, you know, the cowboys, the curlers, the, the, all of the people who show up, there's, you know, there are kids who come out to public meetings and say that they want to propose an Isle of Nothing because you're proposing so many new amenities in this park that there should be a place where there's nothing. And, you know, that, that kind of the strangeness of the audience and the richness of the audience, it's a, it's a cool Back aspect that, of landscape chaos design. chaos you were talking about before. Bill, you worked for a guy named Ralph. And then you worked for a guy named Ignazio, right? And you tell us a little bit about that, and did that help you discover, those two experiences help you discover your own voice? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I was, I, 
graduated as an architect with a capital A and uh, moved to New York to do celebrity housing, as it turned out, in my early years. And a uh, wonderful Italian wood carver named Ignazio, under his breath, muttered after, about something I had designed. But Princeton, huh? That's, that door's going to work out in two weeks. <laughs> and uh, I had an early midlife crisis at the age of 22, I think, and quit my job and joined this woodworking company. And uh, we've always been very craft-based and um, you know, certainly have great debt to the arts and crafts movement in the Bauhaus. But I just, uh, just really did design build and you know, learn the craft up. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, hired by Ralph to work on his Ralph Lawrence residences. And he was doing the store on Madison Avenue. And what was so great about that is that no really wasn't in the vocabulary. If, if the desire was that the entire fourth floor of the home collection be covered in sod by Monday and it was Saturday night, the first response would be, let's look at the structural drawings. Can the building take the moisture? What is the weight load? How are we, you know, we going to get that much sod on a Sunday? So it, it, it was great in that every opportunity was, was there in a in a wonderful way. And the sky's the limit. And it, and it, what, but just to, but in terms of a very, very imaginative, creative team that would just throw things out. And it was, it was great problem solving. So somehow, those two extremes were, were the kernels for probably how, how we approached the design. And in fact, some of the most humble things we there I, I, I did um, over there, too, where I just a you know, whole ceiling in the Montauk residence, which is just an oaky cypress plywood with a couple nickel nail heads. And so it was, it was this combination of the extravagant and then the discreet that I think I, I still <laughs> started probably then. <laughs> the swap stick. <laughs> um, you, Lisa, just worked on a fabulous data visualization project for GE. Um, which helps people understand how much energy they're using or how much energy their appliances use in terms of like their equations, like it spins equations like this is the same as using the t two gallons of gasoline. Is that right? So you could basically tell me when my son's playing the electric guitar how much gasoline he's using up in, in the world of energy consumption. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh boy. Related to some other things that you said uh, earlier, um, just a little bit of background on, on yeah. how I made, how I found this path, um, and then I'll come. That, that's really the present day. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, through architecture, um, and you talk, mentioned the twin, and the um, so. So my interaction design is a new category for the Cooper Hewitt, by the way. This is the second year. Um, so it's not, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not like architecture that's been around for, what, hundreds of years, thousands of years? I don't know. Um, and graphic design, of course, is a little bit newer than that. Um, so interaction design is new. Uh, I came through architecture. I, um, I was really shy because I was an identical twin. I still am an identical twin. Um, and uh, my Do you both work at Pentagram? No. Because no. you do an awful lot of stuff. It could be that there's two of you doing <laughs> it. And we think it's just one. Um, and my you don't sister, know which one is here. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Um, my sister is the alpha twin, I should say. Um, so I was Holy kind smokes. of pathologically shy. And um, so when I was working in architecture, architecture is a really tough profession. I would, I think it's safe to say, and um, and uh, and I think you, yeah, I mean, you are reliant on uh, a lot of other <coughs> collaborators um, and builders. I could never get a job in construction, which I tried to do. Um, so it helps in architecture to be um, a man, maybe. Um, <laughs> you can tell me a little bit more about that. Um, it helps to be maybe kind of physically big to have a loud voice, like it, because you really, it, it's, a, it's tough. Um, 
and I have a lot of admiration. My observation about architecture is it always begins by digging a hole. <laughs> Do you have to dig a hole to be an information architect? No, no. Um, in fact, um, so what I loved, um, so I, I studied architecture and then I found out uh, through this experience at Motorola, because Motorola was hiring architects to do layout design for memory chips. Um, uh, I f so I found out when I was at Motorola about this program at the Media Lab at MIT that was free. And, uh, um, and so when I, the first project that I did, which you can't see very well, is um, when I started at the Media Lab, we had just gotten this batch of Silicon Graphics workstations, and I started working in 3D in information. I never really thought about designing information spaces, but it was very natural. Um, I feel I, I still feel like I leveraged all of my architecture education. Um, so it was this kind of it was for me this aha moment about what I was going to do, and it connected. Muriel Cooper that was my advisor. That data could become spatial. Yes. And, uh, and then I learned after that how to flatten things out. Um, I learned about graphic design uh, in many ways from my experience at Pentagram, to be honest. I'm um, just from mm -hmm. the almost 10 years at Pentagram uh, from my partners and have an appreciation for that discipline um, that I never could have had. Um, so uh, I'm also, I just, I love learning continually Every project is an opportunity to learn something new. Um, and maybe that's a good segue to this GE project, finally. Uh, which, which is flatter, we, right? Which is flatter. Every, things, things are flat now. Um, um, but there's a very, uh, it, it's very much about asking these kind of naive questions. Uh, and in that case, we, we ask the question of what, what is it, how do I engage with um, something like energy consumption. People talk about carbon footprint. Yeah. I don't get it, I yeah. don't feel it. Yeah. Uh, and so, so that, that kind of drives work. I don't makes know if it's all tangible. making sense based on It, it quantifies it in, in a way that we can understand and, yeah. and understand that the price is varying every day of this energy that we use. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't, uh, um, maybe the, the final message of that is that um, th there's, there's still so many opportunities for designers to uh, I think movement in a career is a good thing, um, and uh, the Tiger Woods thing, <laughs> promiscuity, <laughs> good thing. Um, that quote obviously happened uh, before uh, a couple years ago. Yeah. Where we didn't um, know. Yeah, um, but be promiscuous. I think in your career, I think it's. Um, uh, I think sort of crossing boundaries um, yields some interesting results. Um, there, there. They're kind of design educations that focus on very sort of siloed things, but it's interesting to hear that I think what happens and the results, the benefits of sort of moving off a kind of charted path. Mm -hmm. uh, in the teen design fair earlier, I was surprised at how many people at such a young age had decided exactly what, the, what they were going to do, and I encouraged them to, <laughs> to, not. to not be so sure of yeah. themselves. Yeah. Or, no, or don't funnel their, their images necessarily so quite so soon. Well, I'm not going to ask myself questions, so I'll, I'll just show oh, you. We, my... We've got some questions for you. <laughs> I bet you have. I'm going to show you my aha moment um, as a designer when I did feel like I, I had finally discovered a voice that was um, particular to me, with an emphasis, I guess, on particular. And that was um, this piece that I did for the New York Times op ed page. Uh, it, there was a editorial written, uh, an op-ed piece written by Stanley Fish shortly after 9-11, uh, asking uh, how could it be that the terrorists, that the people that we call terrorists, some other people were calling heroes? And the, the gist of it was, are there two ways to look at the truth? And the reason that this piece, I think, was transformative for me was because it was a very, you know, for a graphic designer, the idea, the idea of taking a piece of paper and folding it is a, is a natural thing. But then to turn that into a three-dimensional thing where the type got up off the page and began to cast a shadow kind of completes a circle in the exploration of, I guess, semiotics when a thing is represented by sounds that are represented by symbols that are strung together to create the sound to represent the thing. But then if that word, if those symbols become a thing, 
then that circle is complete. And that kind of has led the way for me to the territory that I'm playing in now. And it's interesting about crossing borders because as a studio, the work that we're doing has, has really left the printed page for the most part, and we're doing an awful lot of um, architectural graphics and exhibition graphics and environmental graphics where we're out there working with, with buildings and parks that can speak to you um, in this whole other three-dimensional language, and I find that incredibly um, exciting. Hey, Tom, do you get this idea that we're going down the line now? You got that? In 1989, Sony owned the portable music market with the Walkman, 1989. Apple asked you guys and a couple other studios for two designs of a computer in the form of a rectangular slab. Your proposals that you guys imagined 21 years ago, you proposed that people would use computers to take pictures and play music people would actually take computers outdoors. Now, if you think about that, for 1989, that's absolutely prophetic and visionary. What do you think products, what, what should we expect from products 21 years from now if smart design had its way? Well, um, hopefully they'd be a lot better, number one, um, in terms of the function, in terms of the experience that people have with them. Um, I think right now, especially with things like you know computers, back then I think computer was really a productivity tool, but we were starting to see uh, the power of the computer chip and also advances in batteries and things like that that led us to believe that you could have a computer like a slab that now eventually 21 years later becomes you know the iPad. Um, it, it takes a long time to get there, but I, I'm thinking that uh, you know, just like what Lisa's working on, you know, right now we're in the infantile stages of, of these types of products. And to tell you the truth, a lot of them, you know, from a human perspective, they, they really don't work very well. Uh, in fact, it's, it's nice when you get one that does what you want it to do. We have, everybody has a cell phone in their pocket. Probably the worst function on that product is making a phone call, almost impossible to do and have any sort of decent conversation. Um, I'm hoping that 21 years from now that the products are maybe more invisible, um, they're more integrated, um, and they're, they're beyond, you know, kind of basic function. They're really about providing, you know, um, quality of life. They're about uh, the pursuit of happiness. They, they go beyond... They're not making a statement on the countertop landscape anymore. Yeah. If well, they're going to become more invisible. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to have a countertop in 21 years. Are we going to have toasters? No, we will. Yeah. Toasters? Pop well, tarts? I just think that right now, um, you know, it depends on the, it depends on the product. There are a lot of products that become um, like heirloom quality, right? You know, a beautiful wristwatch is something that probably costs quite a bit of money, but it's something that can be handed down from generation to generation. I think one of the problems that we're having with uh, consumer electronics is that everybody needs the next new iPhone phone every, every six months, and if there's a lot of churn, um, it, they almost become like fashion accessories as, as opposed to, and, and we're addicted to them. But I'm hoping that we can slow down a little bit and try to be designing and building products that have some longevity, um, something that gets better over time uh, not something that um, gets superseded by the next big, you know, the next new right. thing. As a practicing designer, what, what do you look at as inspiration that's outside of your category? Well, related to this, you know, I chose this uh, picture of the High Line, uh, which I, you know, I walked down uh, uh, several times. But you know, I'm not from New York, so I'm not over there every day. Um, but it, it could also be Central Park. I think it could be a, a beautiful garden in uh, Kyoto, Japan. Um, I look at these places and I think, you know, how great they are that they're available to, you know, the people of say New York City here. That they're democratic. You know, that they don't single you out by gender or by race. Uh, they're, they're pretty much free to everybody. And uh, they get better over time, like I was hoping these products would do. You know, how, you know, and what's even more cool about this is that it changes with the season. So I don't go there and see the same thing every time. It's, it's sort of living, it's growing. 
Um, you know, springtime may, might be very, very different there than, than in the fall. So like if we- mom throwing them out of the house in the middle of the winter. <laughs> exactly, well, you know, in the middle of the winter, I don't know, do they have snow shovels that they, they shovel it with? <laughs> I, I don't know. It no, could be interesting. You, what do you do about snow up there? Um, it's all fairly choreographed. You can, you can plow it with a gator, which is a very small vehicle. You can leave the snow in place if you decide it's a, an appropriate dusting that should be there. You, you know. But you can make a path without shoveling the whole thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not so sure we have the processes and the, the materials today to do it, but I think it would be great if we kind of, we're kind of on this, you know, based on our economy, we're in these cycles where it's like, the next new thing, the new car, the new phone, the new this, the new that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I look at these things and I say, well, there's something that's gonna last a long time. It's gonna give a lot of people enjoyment. How can, how can we learn, how can product designers learn from that? Um, and uh, you know, it's a challenge, but you know, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Hey, Steve, how about you? What's your inspiration? Uh, you know, many, I think one that um, I put together in response to this really begins with natural systems that we all see and experience every day and speculations on the difference between those systems and the artifices that um, all of we designers make. And um, uh, you know, the, the orchard image is, is up for obvious reasons. It's a very simple system that takes energy from the sun, converts it into another form of usable energy to sustain itself. Um, part of that conversion is into um, the apple, which regenerates the form of the tree itself. Um, but at the same time, it generates more of them than are needed to regenerate itself. And it becomes part of the sustenance of others, including we human beings. And thinking about that more metaphorically and asking questions of, um, of biology and chemistry today and where they're gonna take us, I think is one passage forward um, through material science that remains hugely inspirational to our, our firm and um, to my partner and I. And uh, uh, we don't know exactly where it's gonna go, but it's already going in directions that um, suggest that some of these fundamentally differing notions of buildings may someday become tenable, where they can regenerate themselves, um, generate more than they use, um, and literally um, potentially even replace themselves. Is there a word for that? I mean, you're, you're going beyond sustainable now into uh, uh, healing. Uh, healing or regenerative design would be you know, words um, used in today's lexicon for it, but, um, but just looking at, uh, at, at what material science is starting to yield in terms of organic chemistry and asking questions about how that can be integrated into um, building materials to potentially push us forward um, into realms we just can't even imagine at this point in time of... Uh, Don't you want to take his class? <laughs> That sounds great. Okay, Ellen, inspiration? Um, the, the top image is, uh, they're both actually from uh, Toronto, from a project we did called Lake Ontario Park. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the top image, maybe both, are is something that we all have access to. You know, when you travel, this is what you travel for. Um, there's a kind of richness to landscape experience that almost everybody can relate to, at least when it works at scale and over time. Um, maybe not on the garden level, but at this level, you know, the, the super inspiring to, you know, you wake up at five to catch the first light to get the wildlife out and the ice flows and the light coming up and um, you know, the landscapes themselves are really inspiring. And I think um, what, maybe what I got the most from my association with uh, Jim Corner um, was the idea that design shouldn't kill the landscape that's there. Um, 
that we need to, um, you know, find what's there, uh, find ways of not recreating the landscape that was before, but um, to in, sort of re-enliven its spirit, to um, bring back its ecological productivity, to, um, to help people explore landscape as they once did, to, you know, not to deaden the experience, to create all the paths that take you to all the places that, uh, you know, make it all legible, but to leave some of that sense of the place that is there um, that we all, you know, that we all look for. Beautiful. Okay, Bill? Um, uh, Eileen Gray, um, I think is my, my gray here. One, because she, I don't really believe in the division between architecture and interior design. I, I think, you know, if I were to give, be given the task of designing a city, I would start with the doorknob and, and work out, just because I, uh, that's just my method. I'm a behaviorist, and so I like to say, okay, you wake up in a bed, what's the space between the next thing and work outwards? And so I love that about her. I, I love the fact that she was an architect, she was an interior design. I love the fact that she embraced modernism and, and reference and, and lavishes in materials, but also change. You know? A chair that's collapsible, furniture that moves, furniture that interacts with people. Yeah, I still my nightstand is still one of her circular tables that you know, can raise and lower and swivel. Um, I think it's as applicable today. And now you can take as, a computer outdoors. As, exactly. Um, and and I, I think that's the most important thing in our, our profession to kind of embrace change and to have new problems thrown at you and new materials. But then still with an eye to for me it's an eye to the past, and maybe it's my Perhaps it's my upbringing where, I'm sure I come from a long line of animists, where objects have souls. And it really aren't, it's not about possession, but it's about heritage. And in my, my family, each object has a story. And usually everything with a dent in it is associated, you know, there's a story associated with it. So for me, it's also paying tribute. You know, when I use an object, um, it's with reverence. And you know, I, I think there's a big difference between knocking off and paying homage to, and, and I, I love playing homage to, to things. You know, I, you know, I always say that you know, design is a language, and like a language, I didn't invent the words. I just, I just you know, tell a different story with them. So, so I, I, I do love um, kind of paying tribute to all the people that have given me so much, you know, whether they realize it or, or not. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Lisa? So it seems so knee-jerk and crass to put this up here, um, um, but uh, the iPad. Um, I am inspired by excellence and innovation, um, and I'm grateful that uh, my colleagues on this panel um, have, you know, for the work that you're doing. Uh, I the thing that I find so amazing about this, I love. Um, um, from the Apple end of things, uh, the um, the kind of fanaticism, relentlessness that I my, my, it's, at least I have this myth about Steve Jobs and um, Jonathan Ive. Um, I, I heard a rumor that uh, Steve Jobs held back the iPhone by a year because the original design had an antenna in the form. So I love um, again the sort of relentlessness and beauty and perfection of the radii and the, the form. Um, and the sort of insanity of putting uh, a product in the market that had no category, uh, and um, and yeah, the, the, I like the word and quixotic. They feel so good. They and they feel, feel so, so good. good. Um, and then on top of that, I love um, the other thing that inspires me is the fact that um, the market responded. So this is also um, so that article is key. Um, I love that. I love the reach of what we can do. Um, in this medium. Um, I, lo I love that uh, that quality and excellence is rewarded. Uh, I, I could go on about like the, the brilliance of the revenue model. Um, and I mean, I, I also love really brilliantly designed revenue models um, um, because it means that a, a product can be sustained in the marketplace. Um, I think, by the way, this panel was really, I, I hope that it was, um, has been, great for the audience, but um, I think this panel, by the way, was really brilliantly designed, um, so I appreciate that as well. Thanks. Thanks.
Um, one more image here, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys if, if you have questions. I was just blown away when I saw the British Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo. I didn't, I didn't go there, but the images of it are profound. It's this gorgeous porcupine of a building, but the, the thing that thrills me most is that somehow, and I figured, haven't figured out how they did it, somehow when you look at it at the right angle, it actually represents a British flag. <laughs> it's got a cross in it, and then it's got those two diagonal crosses. It is really an exquisite piece of architecture that it's simply fun. just goes out there and makes you, makes, it causes wonder, I think. It was designed design? by somebody I've never heard of him before called um, Thomas Heatherwick, which is like such a great name. If you have a name like that, then you have to design a building like this, right? <laughs> but I, you know, the idea of just putting something gorgeous like that in a, in a public space so that people can engage with it is, is thrilling. That's, that's what I aspire to somehow, someday. We'll see. Um, we would love to entertain questions from the audience, if you have any. Oh, look, it's getting lighter out there. Uh, we have somebody walking around with a microphone in the back, if you wish. Do you want to try just shouting it out? Yeah, sure. Um, I noticed that each individual has their own field of study and their expertise. How do you feel or work with it, um, each other? I mean, we, we in architecture certainly. Oh, hi. My question was, each individual up here, um, some of them have similar backgrounds uh, with design. Either it's interior design, architecture, architecture, or uh, graphic design. How is it working with each other in the industry? And what are the difficulties and the the pros and the cons of and how do you work through that? I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's very, very common for us as architects to work with, in some instances, fifteen or twenty different disciplines of design or engineering um, involved in the making of a building. Certainly, including landscape architecture graphic design, um, sometimes interactive design, things like that. Um, but it's very common. And I, for us, I think the most important act of design at the start of a project is designing the collaboration. Who are the collaborators? Um, what can they bring that will be um, complementary and expand the capacities of everybody else into places they haven't been before? Um, you know, along with the simple design of who's doing what and when, and uh, who's leading at what points, who's following. Um, you know, that that whole act of designing a set of human relationships has to be carefully orchestrated and thought through as a design problem, just like everything else we do, um, or those collaborations aren't very likely to be successful. It, it, it's some, uh, there's a string, uh, string quartet that I, I, I love. It talked about the idea of flow, that there's a moment when everybody's playing as an individual, and then there's some other life it takes on when it's, you know, it, it, there's a moment of, of water being still, and then what's, when does it become flow? And all of a sudden, it takes on its own life. And I, I, for me, it's very much like that. Unfortunately for myself, if I were given a blank check, put on the table, and told to design something, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, I would love to be that type of person in some ways, but um, all of my ideas are kind of formed outside of my head, interacting with my clients' problems. I, I, I love the problem-solving component, and absolutely, you know, I, I, it's so hard to, in, a, in this short a time period to really capture everything we all do, but one of the things that's been very, very important in our work is collaboration with artists or or if some, a site is displacing something to incorporate that, and as you talked about the, economic, the economics, you know, if something is being displaced, we really try to incorporate, incorporate that into the project so that yeah. there, there is a, a, a method of rehabilitation or <laughs> sustainability. So um, you know, for me, it's all about the interaction. Uh, and I think the dialogue is so much fun when you're working with people that you respect 
and the, there's just so much more to learn by collaborating with people who are approaching the same problem from a very different kind of point of view. I just love what happens. And I don't have I don't have such an ego to think that I am you know, that I can design every everything. We, for example, Gucci. I think there were things like 550 stores in seven years, and globally and it was such a thrill to collaborate with architects and designers and urban planners throughout the world in that kind of mm -hmm. kind of think tank to uh, to design these things responsibly and to understand their impact. So. The public side of it can be great too. Um, you know, we for each site for each project, if if we're in the lead, we try and find all the the partners we want to collaborate with. But a big part of it is what happens when you show up to the public meetings um, in the kind of design that we do um, to, uh, to actually engage the ideas that people bring to it when they protest, uh, when, they, you know, when they bring different ideas to it, when they hate what you've uh, initially suggested about the site. It's kind of a, you know, the, the non-expert participant uh, is, a, is a great aspect of the, the design problem as well. Right. And so the only other thing I would add is that none of our disciplines exist in a vacuum, right? So you can't really have interaction design without, you know, uh, uh, graphic design. I mean, while you, a machine level, you could or something like that. But in many cases, like a product, from my point of view, that's designed really well has to consider all these things as, you know, one vision, as one thought, as one idea. And when products don't work well, that's because somebody Design, did the industrial design and they threw it over the wall and somebody else did some interaction design on it and they threw it over a wall and somebody else did some graphic design and somebody else figured out the brand and this and that and you wind up with a, a disjointed um, end result. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's almost mandatory that you need to open yourself up as designers and kind of embrace that there's other designers uh, that you're going to need their help and I think the trick is finding people you like to work with, you know? people that you share the, some of the same yeah. ideas with. Yeah, same language yeah. in a way. Different yeah. field, same language. Yeah. Do we have time for another question, organizers? One more question. Um, oh, wait, that's the same table. <laughs> <laughs> Feisty crowd of them. Well, it helps we don't know each other. Um, so, um, I was just curious. Um, you all seem to think um, really intelligently about how you design for people and I was curious if there's any books or blogs or anything that that you have read recently or um, that you continue to read if it's a blog for instance that really has changed how you design um, not necessarily recently as in the past week but like past couple years or something and and if there is a way in which you continuously feed yourself, like if there's a place you always go to find a new book to change your mind or to inspire you to design in a new way, or if you just happen to come upon new ideas or new um, things that influence how you design. Like more kind of, not like inspiration, but more like mindset, like cradle to cradle, for instance, that changed how I think about design drastically, something like that. I'm, I always go back to old things. So you know, I, I read gardening texts like they're pornography. So, so my, my, the book I found again was In Praise of Shadows, which is about um, the Japanese aesthetic and culture pre-electric light and how that you know, just a culture that really embraced the beauty of darkness and reflection. And it just, yeah, it was one of those things where you know, it, was, it, was this, it was the wine glass and suddenly it began the silhouette where it just, it, it completely inverted the way I look at the world um, and how much depth there is in, in, in darkness. Because you can't, you can't have light without dark. And um, so I, you know, now I'm kind of, I'm uh, certainly embracing that. I just want to add, um that there's a, a design consultant named Steve Croder who um, asked this very question um, and is about to launch, I don't want to make this sound like a plug, but is about to launch a site called designersandbooks.com. 
uh, and uh, actually we did the design part, but um, uh, but anyway, it's so copies. relevant. Um, <laughs> So it, it's, it's really based on that question, and he asked a bunch of designers, and I think the list will be growing. Uh, he started with 50. Um, what books have influenced their thinking and work? And Design Observer also posts a lot of books and references and, and people connecting designers with other, with, with that food, with the intellectual food. Right, so, so I would say, um, yeah, you can look to other designers and, um, in terms of inspiration and new ideas. It's also great to just go out and look at people. What are people doing today? Um, under, you know, especially if that's your audience. I think in many cases, design serves the users, and you know, maybe you have like a, a, a small market or something like that. But it could also be kind of a vast community. And uh, I think if you can go out and, and get to know them, understand them, observe them, then that can lead to a lot of inspiration as well on a project. So I think that's it. I think that wraps up this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. And thanks to people here for um, this wonderful design week and sharing design so freely with so many people. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. I guess I'm a moderator now, right? Eh?